It is my honor now to introduce a preacher from another vineyard, the Reverend Dr. Susan Taylor. And she is, as you know, the founder of the National Cares Mentoring Movement. She is, as you know, one of the grand dames of the literary scene of African American culture over the last half century. She is, you know, the former editor-in-chief of Essence Magazine and then the editorial director. You know she is the very icon that launched a black female consciousness in America. Now, we got Sister Burke here tonight with Me Too, and she is a path blazer and she is a trail blazer, but the woman we're introducing to now before there was a collective feminist consciousness, before there was the conception that black people ought to be worthy of consideration, before black women were recognized, this iconic black woman was doing the work in the trenches without either gratitude or nearly the compensation that was commensurate to the depth of her talent. And so here, when she should be in the sunset of her life, hanging out with Kefra Burns, reciting love poetry to each other, giving each other the blues, but not in a bad way, giving each other the, the reciprocal admiration and the mutual support that they deserve, she is on the front line serving our people. Even as she comes to the stage, I'ma still introduce her. She is one of the coldest, most bold, most brilliant, most gifted, lovely, delightful, but on the front line, courageous black woman who stands for our children. You ought to get up on your feet and celebrate the queen of black America, Susan Taylor. That's right. Mm -hmm. Reverend Shafton, I know you're still here and you have to leave. So where are you so we can at least greet you? He's downstairs, he has to leave, so we're gonna ask Freddie Haynes to say the blessing. So he's gonna have to get ready to bless us. We're not gonna do it right now. After this, then you come up. But you know, we're gonna do something special tonight because we don't want, tomorrow's a work day. And you know how when the food goes down or is trying to get down, how we all get up I'm guilty of it too. We're gonna to ask you to keep your seats, let the food get down, eat quickly, and then you can get up and talk to one another so that we can move the program along. So the waiters can get through and you can eat and then the program will continue, okay? Because we have young ones who need to get back to New Jersey so that they can go to school tomorrow. Michael Eric Dyson, this is my son, my beloved. Did you know, tonight is really an honor to God. And my heart is it's overflowing with gratitude. On behalf of the, just the thousands of children we serve, CARES exists for one reason, because the village is on fire. You know, all of us together must become those healing waters that are needed to just help our children move forward. And I want to acknowledge before the community some of those who have stepped mightily, mightily into the scene, onto the stage to help you know, our children really move forward. And we have the folks who work with me every day and our 58, our leaders from 58 cities, they're gonna stand in a moment, but nothing happens at CARES without their efforts. And while I wish I could name every one of them, I can't, but let me tonight just at least do this. Let me just say that, you know, we love you and we adore you. They are the dedicated ones critical to the needs. They work critically for the needs of our children. And I want to introduce at least two of the leaders flanking me. Chief Program Officer, our wonderful, beloved one, Director of, sorry, Stephen Powell. That's you, Chief Program Officer, who we love. Thank you. And our Director of Development, Jane Chu. Right, they just hold it together every single day. And we have, this is the national team. This is the national team. 
So they go beyond the telling in doing the work that is so needed for our community. But I want you to meet also the heart and soul, the heart and soul of this restorative community movement. They are the CARES affiliate leaders, our soldiers of love. Just finishing up three days of training, they've come from all over this country, deepening their work. Please stand, our soldiers of love. Our national affiliate leaders, see them on either side. Yes, thank you and we bless you. Volunteering across the nation, they recruit, they train and deploy mentors to schools and youth support organizations. We're in detention facilities. And over the years, these volunteer sisters and brothers have recruited over 150,000 mentors who are serving over 200,000 young people. You know? And now we're training them to, facilita to facilitate wellness mentoring circles right in the neighborhoods. I'm so glad I'm a child of Harlem because I'm not afraid of us, you know? <laughs> Stepping back into the community. But none of this work, none of it, none of it, would be possible if Rose Jackson Flournoy, where are you, Rose, and Pam Crindenden Johnson, my FedEx family. You know, it wouldn't be possible if you didn't step up and help us to fund the digital build out, you know, of CARES. You just invested when we didn't even know how we would do this. And somebody said, go to FedEx. Don't ask for money, ask for them to do the digital work, you know? I didn't ask for money initially, but I did then. And you stepped up, you know, you funded the University for Parents, our rising program, and everything that we've asked you for. And I just want you to know that we appreciate you. And it wouldn't be possible, we wouldn't be here tonight if it weren't for AARP, uh, the president, uh, CEO, Joanne Jenkins, you know, if she hadn't said yes. And where's my dear Edna Kane Williams? Edna! You know, just in planning this gala and thinking about how we would do it, just thank you for lending me your ear and your heart and giving me, I mean, profound wisdom. Thank you. Our AT&T family, you know, brought to us by beloved Cynthia Marshall. Where's Cynthia? Cynthia, thank you. She was the president of AT&T North Carolina, and she brought to us the beloved, I mean, she funded us in, in uh, where were we, Greensboro and other places in North Carolina too, and then brought our beloved Tanya Lombard. Where's my Tanya Leah Lombard, who just loves us so. She's not here yet? Well, you tell her I called her name. I hope she's watching, streaming, because she called me all day. Where could she be? Come on now, Tanya. And Gail, is Gail Johnson? I saw Gail. Gail, thank you. Thank you so much. You said yes. And Robert Smith, he's not here. He's in the Middle East, but we know that we're streaming and you're watching, you said you would. So we feel your love and your presence tonight. And my first home, my beloved essence. Rishilu, where are you? Rishilu Dennis. Rishilu, stand up our brother who has shown such respect for the power, the dignity, and the beauty of black women with the purchase of essence. You brought it back home, Rishilu. And we love you. We love you for it. And you also appreciated the brilliance of Michelle Ebanks. Where's Michelle? The president of Essence. Michelle Stand. The Essence family. Patrick Henry Bass, I know you're here. Where are you, Patrick? You know, Rishi Lou's grandmother, who was Sarah Leonian, gave him the idea of using shea butter, and it's shea butter, shea moisture company is the one that he began. He told me he started selling it on 125th Street, you know, humble man, and look what you did. You know, you saved, you strategized, and you and Michelle put together something that never happens, you know, that we brought back what was ours. So for that, we really thank you. And you know, Essence is home for me. This, this movement, this CARES movement was born at Essence, as Essence CARES, and we launched it. We launched it at the Essence Festival after the horrific Hurricane Katrina just damaged so many young people's lives. So I'm just overjoyed that our presenting sponsors are here tonight and your generosity has made this possible. And I'm really excited that we're joined by goal sponsor, Casey Family Programs.
I'm thrilled that William Bell, where are you, Dr. Bell, that you're here tonight with us. Just stand and let people see you. You know, thank you so much. All the way from Seattle. Thank you. And an array of silver and bronze sponsors who return year after year because of you. You know, we're linking arms and aims and we're going to get this work done for our children. They will win. And we'll win because Tommy Dorch, Tommy Dorch, our founding chairman, stand up, Tommy. He's now chairman, again, of the 100 Black Men of America. He helped to build the foundation of CARES. And we'll win because of Eddie and Sylvia Brown. Where are the Browns? Eddie and Sylvia, please stand up, Eddie and Sylvia. You know, I have to tell you, our first North Star honorees, they gave us wings and the courage, the courage to insist on black philanthropy. You know, Eddie and Sylvia said, we're going to donate, but you have to raise money from black people. We want to see black people take care of black people. So, and every staffer at the Brown Capital Management firm who donates to CARES, they match it, including the very generous, the very generous Keith Lee. Where are you, Keith? Keith, stand up. Those checks, they come regularly every year, big checks. And then Eddie and Sylvia match the checks. I mean, how brilliant is that? You know, and I just want to just say thank you for the excellence, Eddie Brown, that you exemplify and your gentle spirit. You know, it's sort of, it's a, it's a way shower for us. And you all should know that what he's built is the first Morning Star award-winning company that is black owned at the top tier. So all you moneyed people in here, you should be investing your money with Eddie Brown. If I had more time, I'd tell you a story of how you know, he was marginalized with a particular organization. And because a black person was on the board, they said, we're going to give him an opportunity. He'd been knocking on that door for a long time. They opened the door, and guess what happened to their stock portfolio? It went from here to here. So you're really a quiet genius. Thank you for undergirding us in a way that really was substantial and helped to move us forward. We're going to win because that first funding for the rising, when we could work, when we could raise no money, and it took three years to raise a dime. And because of Sean Dove, where is my Sean? Sean Dove. Where are you? Sean, yes, thank you. CEO of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. He really made it happen. And Sean is really the founder of My Brother's Keeper. He's the one who really initiated it, my brother's keeper. You are my brother, and you have kept us well. Thank you. Ah, Mark Moriel. Mark, are you in the house with beautiful Michelle? Is Mark here? I thought he was going to be here. They said he was going to be here, but Mark is all over the place. But Mark was first. The first partnership we ever had was with the National Urban League, and what he did was really significant. So I wanted to thank him for guiding me. And Jack Benson, who is, brings tears to my eyes. This man is so very beautiful. He's the executive producer of our show. Where's my Michaela? My Michaela Angela Davis. Stand up, baby. Because you brought us Jack Benson 10 years ago, and he never left. Every video, every beautiful video that he has done has been a gift to us. Amazing. He's given it to us, Michaela. He's given it to us. I'm talking about millions of dollars worth of work, and he's one of the most sought after producers in the whole hip hop community. Where are you, Jack? Wave over that balcony. Jack Benson, is that you up there? There he is. Stand up, Jack. Come on, we want to see you. Stand up. He won't get up, but that's Jack Benson. Okay, my beloved family. You know my family, my, the love of my life, Mr. Kefra Burns. Stand up, my Kefi whose historical timeline you're going to see in just a moment, you know. And the greatest gift, our daughter Shauna, my Shauna, and of course, my son-in-love, Bernard King, and my granddaughter, our granddaughter, Amita. Can my family please stand? My sister Lil and Reg and Ambassador Shabazz and Gail and Lena and Andriette, Sheila. All of my friends are here tonight, my family. I just love you all so much. Thank you for holding me. Okay. So, despite the joy that I have, and I know we're doing God's work, I am disturbed, you know, as, as Dr. Barber said, by so little mention of poverty, of so little mention of poverty in this wealthy country, the wealth, wealthiest in the world. 
And extreme poverty is defined in the United States, this is so unbelievable, by the US Census Bureau as a household income of $12,129. $12,129 for a family of four with two related children. You can't live on that. So CARES is building webs of support around the most vulnerable and defenseless in our communities, staffed with CARES trained healers and psychologists, social workers. Some of them are here tonight from Chicago, Atlanta, Detroit. Psychologists, stand up. You've come all the way. Just stand and let us applaud you. Thank you so much. Those are us, four of our psychologists, you know. So we work in group mentoring circles. So we transform whole schools. That's the model that we've built. We're raising money tonight to really replicate that work. And so we're trying to create pathways to economic stability for children and families struggling from the effects of poverty that are far beyond our view. We don't see the hunger and the homelessness, the unrelenting violence that our children are subjected to, living in dilapidated housing and gravely under-resourced schools. Our work is consciousness shifting. That's what we do. It teaches critical thinking, instills racial pride and self-confidence, a passion for learning, a, a devotion to wellness in body, mind, spirit, and community. And the most important work of all is creating mutuality. We have to learn how to love one another again, trust one another, create strategic alliances to move ourselves and our struggling people toward wellness and economic independence. That's the goal. You know, there are more impoverished, as the pastor said, white Americans than there are any other group. They live in pain below the radar. No, you can't even call the name of an advocate who is speaking on behalf of white impoverished people. Poverty hurts no matter what color you are. Our restorative strengthening models are easily adaptable to other cultures and communities, and we are building them to share. We're moving marginalized people into the middle class. Society has written them off, and what we're doing, we're writing them back in, Judy. We are writing them, writing them back in. And so, together, we're creating valued employees and entrepreneurs who will work together to renew that entrepreneurial spirit that needs to be breathed, new, have new life breathed into it in our community. So this is our vision, given what our poor parents have given to the world, what our children are suffering through today. I have long wanted to answer a question, a question that media never asks. It's the why of black poverty. So the history by my beloved Kefra Burns the rising video by Jack Benson, and the University for Parents testimonies captured by Emmanuel Mills of Milas Media, uh, Media down in Atlanta. Here, you're going to see the truth that is seldom told. Look back. This is the truth of who we are. The villages and communities of our African forebears were bound by the belief that family and the elders were to be revered, that all endeavor was for the children, for they mattered most. But the pillaging of resources of people over centuries destroyed black lives and their ancient civilizations. This is the truth of what happened to us, the story rarely told. Captured and cargoed to the Americas, enslaved Africans and their African-American and Caribbean descendants endure 244 years of forced labor. We are the benefactors of the Western world's enormous wealth, the uncompensated lifelong labor on which capitalism was built on lands appropriated from Native Americans. Resilient, we survived to see emancipation and during Reconstruction made greater strides in a shorter period of time than any group in the history of this nation. African Americans acquired land, built churches and businesses, established black colleges and universities, elevating lives, and served in Congress. But today, millions of African Americans exist in the grip of poverty and the lies and stereotypes of black pathology used to explain it. That dream-crushing poverty is not the result of black pathology, but the cause of it. 
It is a poverty not of ambition or industry, but of means, a poverty rooted deeply in the denial of opportunity, legalized injustices, underfunded inferior schools, and the inherited disadvantage of more than 244 years of lost income. Today, black pain and poverty are criminalized, and our young are murdered with impunity by those pledged to protect and serve. Policing in the United States begins with the slave patrols, organized to protect property. Black people were property. Post-emancipation, the incarceration of black men becomes a way around the abolition of slavery. Chain gang labor and convict leasing programs mark the birth of the prison industrial complex. Sharecropping virtually re-enslaves black families for generations. The black codes and vagrancy laws ensure that black men who can't find work will be arrested, imprisoned, and forced back into slave labor. Domestic terrorism begins with the KKK and the thousands of lynchings of black men, women, and children. Poll taxes, literacy tests, intimidation, and murder keep black people from the polls. Redlining denies us loans and banking services, barring those avenues to building wealth. Prosperous black communities in Chicago, Atlanta, East St. Louis, Rosewood, Florida, and the storied Black Wall Street of Tulsa, Oklahoma, are burned to the ground in envy. Aid to families with dependent children creates the fatherless black household with the mandate that no adult male can reside in the home. Mafia drug cartels target black communities with heroin, the CIA with crack cocaine. But nothing in recent times has wreaked greater devastation than the war on drugs. Targeted, arrested, convicted by white juries, handed lengthy sentences for offenses that got others a slap on the wrist, generations of young, poor, black and brown people have been disappeared behind walls of a for-profit system of mass incarceration. Incomes were lost, black families and communities destroyed. Lost also were the wisdom, traditions, and know-how that are passed from parent to child. This is who we are, and this is how we got here. But the truth of black existence and resilience always struggles to the surface. The young we serve in 58 U.S. cities are mostly the offspring of those whose lives were torn asunder. They are the children most in need of the village we're rebuilding. Hear them speak for themselves about the efficacy of group mentoring with CARES-trained leaders, psychologists, social workers, and volunteer mentors. See how our culturally anchored and proven curricula are changing and nourishing their lives. The best day I ever had was um, the day when we had the Sankofa. You put your right hand down and your left hand up. You just relax. I clear my mind. Negative energy out, positive energy in. <sighs> you just breathe, let everything out. All the negative energy come out. Before I was in the Rising program, I had a lot of stuff on my chest. My dad is in jail. I was mostly thinking about that more than I was thinking about schoolwork. The stuff that was on my chest was just running through my mind. Always thinking about things with my mom because currently she's in a mental home. She's schizophrenic. It was kind of really tough growing up. My mom, she didn't know how to deal with her hurt and her pain, and she made some wrong choices, and those choices came on to me. My oldest sister, she done been incarcerated three, four times from 18 to 22. I done missed, what, 10th grade, half of my 11th grade. At the time that she was back and forth in jail, her son was just turning one, just had a daughter. I make sure everything taken care of at the house, taken care of with the kids, and miss out on that, that, that very important education. And I just let people think what they think about what's going on, like, oh, he probably just missing school to miss school, not knowing that it's a reason behind everything. To see people being shot and killed in front of me, not one, not two, it was many. I lost my mom 
at the age 12, I lost my dad at the age of nine. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was being loved. And I was in and out of children um, facilities. I was in and out of children facilities and I felt like I didn't have no family. When I first heard about the Rising program, I really thought I knew everything on my own. I didn't need anyone's input on nothing. I was just like, hey, this is a free time to get out of class. I'm getting out of class. They like, they let you know it ain't that type of party. I don't like to talk about the negative things that happened in my life, but like coming in, I'm, I'm chilling with them, talking to them, they, 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 let, they, they help you open up. I don't have a choice about talking to them about it because they just bring it right out you. It's not even any, it's not a debate about it. They just bring it straight. It helped me with finding pieces of other people's lives and piecing it to mind, putting myself into their shoes and seeing things that I liked, their things that I wanted. Honestly, it gives me confidence having to be able to talk with everybody, like their like brother, their family. It's really comforting to have that. Like people won't judge you when you try and just get something out, get your point across. It's really comfortable. I really like interacting with the other kids. I mean, I really like to just talk with them and find out more about them. Like when we talk about personal stuff, like on a personal level, I like the fact that they can trust everyone in the circle and I can also trust everyone in the circle. I have an anger issue inside of me. I just let it all out. I felt like all the weight was lifted off my back. Okay, Chevelle, you need to get back on track, go back to this 4.0 and be what you wanna be. We had to um, make up a handshake with a partner and it really taught me, it's the weirdest thing ever, but it taught me about teamwork. I've never really been able to work with someone else and think about their ideas and think about my ideas and then put our ideas together. It's a relief that I can even walk into a classroom and feel hurt, but when I leave, I feel more successful. The Rising program is a very trustworthy group. You're going to be loved 100%. I'm super happy. They made me feel as if my words inspired them. And by them telling me that, it makes me want to do more. We need that brain over time, too. We need that brain. Before the rise and the biggest dream I had for myself, was to become a successful drug dealer. I was in gangs. I didn't know there was anything else I can do. Many of my friends are incarcerated. Others are in gangs. Some are dead. Most of us come up not having any idea that a life without gangs and violence was even possible. But the work the rising shows us otherwise. It shows us that life is possible. It showed me that I can make some other choices, that I didn't have to take penitentiary chance to become successful putting me in jail or in a casket. It helped me see that I'm a smart young man and could be a proud black man and it helps in my community if I was given a chance. <laughs> the Rising gave me a chance. It gave thousands of students in my city a chance. And in March, I will graduate with my associate's degree, which is the first step towards me doing all I can to make the health and the strength of my community possible. My name is Tamika Moore. I have six children ages 12, 10, 15, 8, 6, and 4. My husband died in May 2016. My pastor was concerned about me and my family, so he referred me to University of Parents. Well, I'm glad he did because it changed me and my family's life. But what I didn't realize that it would help and change everything. So I thank God for being here for that. And the staff here was very nice and loving and caring. And they made me feel like I wasn't being judged here. So I learned to how to deal with stress management and how to, if I had a bad day, how to release myself so I can deal with my kids as they come home from school. I also was able to deal better with, as far as obtaining my GED, it helped me better to, able to help my kids with their schoolwork and obtain my GED all in the same, I passed everything and I was so excited. And I was able to enroll in the nursing program at Atlanta Technical College within six months of that same time. 
So I'm very grateful to what I've learned here at the University of Parents. And it's hard, it's hard but it, it, I, I just know to keep going and to, despite what I see, continue on because I know that at the end of the day that there's tomorrow. I'm very thankful for University of Parents and the staff here, and I've come back because it's a pathway to who I want to become. So and then I thank God for University of Parents, and I hope to learn more here. Thank you. I'm Damian Owens. I'm the parent of two teenage girls, Samaya and Sequoia Swanson, ages 15 through 16. Uh, my experience at the University of Paris has been awesome. It has been liberating. And it, it's just an experience like I haven't experienced before. And why I say that is because it has helped me become a better person, a better man, and just a better person contributing to society as a, in general. Um, before I came to the university, I've done a lot of things. I've sold drugs, I've carried guns, I've, you know, I've did a lot of things that I'm not proud of. And I uh, wound up incarcerated and had time, you know, just to think about the things I was doing, where my life was going, but I didn't know how to get there. And when I wound up at the University for Parents, it just, you know, now I got a job, you know, they uh, sent me to electrician classes and just helped me be a better person, you know, contributing society on the legal side. I just hope, you know, that I'm able maybe in the future to pass down what was passed down to me. And I just thank the university for parents for allowing me into the program and there's no judgments or anything and you can actually feel the love if you was here that, you know, the structures and the people that run it, they care. And it's free. So i probably charge if I was doing that good, but, you know, and I'd just like to say that. Thank you.